Yeah. Uh, thank you, Julie, and uh, thank you to all the members of DevRSM uh, joining across the globe. And uh, to highlight about DevRSM India branch, uh, as as you all are like witnessing every month, uh, we are uh, hosting two different different webinars with our most of the prominent speakers from across the globe. And, uh, and certainly, I would focus on today's webinar, which is going to be very interesting. And like many of the audiences, they have talked about or they wanted to know about human performance ops. So in this webinar, we are going to uh, discuss and see from our speakers like regarding the subject. And uh, WSM India LinkedIn page, uh, they have crossed 900 plus uh, followers. And thanks for that. Now coming towards uh, just uh, to highlight about our speakers. And today's our speaker is Mr. Tony Mushara. He is the principal consultant and owner of Mashara Herald Management Consulting, LLC. So basically, he is a specialist in the field of human error, risk management, for mostly industrialized enterprises and have been consulting independently since he retired from Institute of Nuclear Power Operations in 2007. And uh, one of the, not I would say one, and he has like he has been the author of risk based thinking managing the uncertainty of human error in operations and he has developed his expertise in human and organizational performance of which has applicability to any human endeavors especially hand on work while employed at industrial nuclear power operations tony has authored several industrial applications which include among other human performance Human Reference Manual, etc. So, and if talk about education, he holds Master of Business Administrations and Bachelor of Science degree in General Engineering Mechanical from United States Naval Academy. So, this was a few about our speakers today. And uh, now I'd like to hand over to our speaker. Uh, yes, Tony, sir, over to you. Well, thank, thank you very, you. thank you very much, Mohit. Well, let's jump right in. I know that uh, time is uh, of uh, of essence here. Um, <clears throat> Dr. James Reason, who wrote several books on human performance, human error, back in the 1990s, uh, uh, quote is quoted as saying, "What activities, if performed less than adequate, uh, pose the greatest risk to the well-being of the system?" And uh, I know that that's what uh, your, your, your institute is all about, is uh, risk and safety management. And I'm gonna talk to you about uh, critical steps. These are particular activities in the workplace that workers uh, need to be aware of that could cause serious harm if you lose control of them. The goal of managing critical steps, and I'm gonna define that here in a moment, is to maximize the success of people's performance uh, achieving value in what they are doing without triggering harm to their assets. So let's move let's move on to the next slide. All right. All right. I'm still having problems moving this thing on. Okay. Tony, can you see, can you see um, when you have your presentation up, normally in the bottom left-hand corner, you'll see um, very slight forward and backwards buttons. So if you click near the right hand, the left-hand side, the bottom of your presentation, normally controls appear there. Yeah, I don't see them. If not, no. you can just forward them on with your PowerPoint. Yeah, there we okay. Go. All right, so you should see a blacksmith there on the screen in the we PowerPoint. Do. Yep, and I, uh, I use the I use the blacksmith as an example because you can see all part the three elements of human performance in the screen. You see the human being, the uh, the blacksmith himself. You see his tools and the materials he's using, and you also you know those are the assets he's producing a product, and at the same time he's working with a hazard, fire, and the very hot coals. And the, the point I want to make here is that work. Is essentially a risk activity, and so so op the opportunity to add value and risk uh, occur at the exact same time. So, if an operation has the capacity to do work, that means force over a distance. Something changes when work is done, then it has the capacity to do harm. 
and that's a quote from Dr. Uh, Dorian Conger uh, of the management oversight risk tree uh, um, uh, expertise. But work is energy directed by human beings to create value. And because human beings aren't, aren't uh, perfect, you know, on a good day, people are around 99, 99.9% .9 reliable. So out of a out of a hundred times, they'll perform an activity uh, correctly. Ninety nine, maybe ninety nine point nine percent of the time, and and so that's a good thing. But Dr. James Reason says that human fallibility, like the weather, like gravity, like the terrain, is just another foreseeable hazard in in the aviation community. And so, <clears throat> work is the use of force under the condition of uncertainty. So here's the here's the definition. I'm gonna I'm not gonna unpack this right now, but I wanted to make sure everybody's on the same page uh, as far as the the definition is concerned. But it's it's what absolutely has to go right to add value to avoid harm during uh, during high risk work. And here's our our definition. So it's a human action that will not may but will trigger immediate irreversible intolerable harm to an asset if that action or a preceding action is performed improperly. And, and, and I'll just remind you, I will unpack that uh, going forward. <clears throat> but let me, <clears throat> let me set the stage, <clears throat> excuse me, let me set the stage here. Um, you, let's, let's pretend there's a, a person that's working for you and uh, that person comes to work <clears throat> and uh, they're, they're emotionally stable, they had a good night's rest, uh, uh, you know, they, they, they are alert, they don't have any distractions, they don't use drugs, or they're not emotionally distressed. And uh, <clears throat> so we come, he, that person comes to work, and let's assume for our illustration that that person is 99% reliable. 99% reliable. <clears throat> Excuse me. 99% reliable. So that means that out of 100 actions, they'll do it right correctly or do it correctly uh, uh, 99 times. So you give that person a, a job, an activity that has exactly 100 steps. So the question for, for you is what's the, what's the probability, what are the chances that that person will perform all 100 steps correctly without losing control, without making a mistake? So another way to, to unpack that particular question is, <clears throat> let's look at step one. If the person is 99% reliable, what's the chances of doing step one correctly? It should be obvious it's 99%. So let's look at, let's move on to step two. And here's the, here's the uh, 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 um, artificial condition associated with this, is I'm assuming nothing changes as far as the, the person, nothing changes in the environment that would inhibit or hinder the person's performance in any way. So the chance of doing step two correctly is just like it is for step one, 99%. So you move on to step three. What's the chances of doing step three correctly? Again, 99%. So here's, a, here's a, another way of asking that question. What's the chances of doing step one and step two correctly? So the calculation is 0.99 times 0.99. So it's something less than 99%. But for all 100 steps, for every one, for all 100 steps, the chance of doing this correctly, all 100 steps correctly, is only 37%. Let that sink in. So the question is, if we, we, if we can only assure ourselves that, that, that all 100 steps will be performed correctly is only 37%, which one, which activities absolutely have to go right? And that's, and that's, the, that's really the, 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 the point of critical steps. And if you look at that, you see these steel workers on the steel beam. This is 1932 uh, during the building of the, uh, what was then the RCA building. Today it's the NBC building. But, but these, these workers are 800 feet above the streets below. And you can tell if they lean back or make a mistake leaning forward or lose their balance in any way, you know, they're gonna die. No, no question about it. So critical steps are those activities that can kill you. 
or at least cause serious harm to your products or to your environment. So we're gonna talk about what must go right. The source document here is uh, from a book that I, I uh, co-authored with Ron Ferris and Jim Marinas. All three of us uh, worked in the in the nuclear power business. All three of us were uh, Navy nukes. We we served in submarines and aircraft carriers. Uh, uh, Ron and Jim are former employees of the Department of Energy, and so they had uh, quite a bit of uh, technical uh, uh, background, operating background as uh, we got together and wrote uh, this, this book. And you can see the outline there. And I'm gonna roughly cover uh, these topics uh, <clears throat> uh, at a very high level because of our time. And you'll notice there at the bottom of the slide, uh, there's some uh, free chapters that you can download from, uh, from the, the website criticalstep.com. So fundamentally, the book attempts to uh, help the reader uh, understand and identify known and unknown critical steps, and then to exercise positive control of those critical steps. And thirdly, if you do lose control of a critical step, how do you how do you fail safely if that's possible? And then the the fourth objective was to is to uh, 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 align and, and and realign the organization or the system to support those first three. And we're going to you know, spend more time on that. <clears throat> so since we're talking about work, work in the workplace, you know, work uh, uh, is where people add value. And there's three phases to the work execution process, preparation, the actual performance of work, execution. And then after the work is complete, there's the learning. In the preparation stage, we're, we're thinking about what do we want to accomplish, but at the same time, what do we want to avoid? Uh, during execution, execution is the, the series of actions and touch points where uh, the frontline worker comes into close proximity with not only the asset, but also the built-in hazards that are used to do the work. And we're talking about transfers of energy. You'll notice there uh, above the execution box, there's a Delta E, a Delta M, and a Delta I. And that, that represents transfers of energy or, trans, or movements of matter, solids, liquids, or gases, or <clears throat> for knowledge workers, maybe it's the transmission of information that creates a, a, a work output. And uh, you'll notice the organization is set up at the blunt end of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the organization that creates the conditions for work in the workplace at the sharp end. But we want to exercise, you know, and, and all this work is happening in a, what we call a VUCA environment. Uh, the VUCA is a, is a short form or an abbreviation for vo volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. And you'll notice the C is, is, is bolded and everything starts with complexity, <clears throat> which leads to uncertainty, which in turn leads to ambiguity. And then associated with this environment are uh, uh, volatile activities and critical steps is, is that part that creates a volatile outcome if we lose control of those critical steps. So we want to, that's where we're going to, we're going to talk about pathways and touch points here in a moment. And those are the actual two points of, of management. So we want to exercise positive control of those transfers of energy or that move, movement of matter or that transmission of information. And if we lose control, we want to make sure there's barriers and safeguards that will protect those assets from serious harm. All right, so here's the concept. You know, most managers, I've run into, uh, I've talked to a lot of managers over in my career, not only in the nuclear power business, but in other industries. And most managers don't know how to think about human performance, much less manage it. And what this, this diagram is trying to convey is, is, is when there's an asset, a built, I'm sorry, when there's a built-in hazard in close proximity with an asset, you have a pathway. You have a pathway for the transfer of energy, movement of matter, et cetera. But then the human is also in close proximity and the human introduces that uncertainty because of human fallibility. So where's the risk? The risk is right there at that confluence of asset hazards and human interaction. 
So <clears throat> pathways are those interfaces between a hazard and an asset. And so going back to our blacksmith, uh, it, when, the, when the iron, you know, the asset that, he, that the blacksmith is working with is in the heat, is in the fire, there's a pathway for the transfer of, of heat energy to the, to the material. But at the same time, we have the human interacting both with the controls of the hazard and also with the asset, moving the asset in and out of the pathway of the, of the hazard. And those are touch points. Those are the things that the human has control of. And once in a while, great while, you know, humans make mistakes. They lose control of the hazard during the work and which could cause harm. So I don't necessarily refer to a human error uh, as much as I, I talk about losses of control. And I think that's the better way to, to think about human performance uh, uh, in the workplace. And by the way, I, I forgot to mention the abbreviation HU in the title there. HU is a short form for human performance. Uh, I don't use HP because in the nuclear industry, you know, there's a there's a group of people called health physicists, which is associated with the control of radiation and contamination. And so in the nuclear industry, they use the short form HU, and I've I've just stayed with that 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 uh, uh, abbreviation. So now let's 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 unpack critical steps. Uh, Let's uh, look closer at those those words, and uh, uh, it's important that you understand uh, what we mean by each element, especially those that are bolded uh, uh, in the in the definition. So here are the attributes of a critical step. You see those in the left-hand column, and uh, just going to briefly go through those. You know, human action is a hands-on direct contact with either the asset and or the the controls of the hazard. Uh, and they're 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 doing something, doing some physical activity. They're exerting force on an object, uh, and and that's usually involving uh, a work. And I mentioned touch points before, and that's those are the elements of a touch point. So a critical step, if you do it inadvertently, or if you do it improperly, there will be harm, some degree of harm. There will be some uh, some uh, change in the asset that that, that, that will be defined as harm. It's inevitable. It's also immediate, it's instantaneous, generally faster than the human can react to avoid the harm. If, if, if it's not necessarily immediate, it will be irreversible. It's like jumping out of a plane. You, it takes time to, to, once you jump out of a plane without a parachute and you hit the, hit the, the surface of the earth, it, you know, the harm's not immediate, but it's definitely irreversible. There's no undo. You're unable to reestablish uh, safe uh, prior conditions. And then finally, it's intolerable. <clears throat> You don't want to use the term critical step for things that are for harm that's not very substantial, like a paper cut. You know, I don't need to know what, you know, what activities involve paper cuts. You know, I can just put a, a Band-Aid on my finger. But we want to understand what's what is the degree of severity that <clears throat> that management is most in, uh, interested in, perhaps the regulator as well. So at this point, I'm going to unshare my presentation because I want you to see. Can you see me now, Julie? Not yet, no. Have okay. you pressed um, stop sharing? Okay. There we All go. Right. We've got you now. Okay. All right. So I got. I want to show you something. Uh, I want to show you what a critical step looks like. And I have some uh, safety gloves here that I need to put on and safety glasses, because I've learned in my past that things don't always go exactly the way I intended them to. And uh, I wanna show you a rat trap. All right, can you, you see that? All right, so how does a rat trap work? Well, there's these springs here. <clears throat> so there's stored energy, there's stored energy here. And I need to, Move that to the side. There we go. All right. So there's stored energy here, and uh, and usually what I do uh, to catch a rat, not mice, but rats, uh, I use I put a little bait. Usually here in the United States, we use peanut butter, uh, and we put that on the bait pad or the trigger mechanism here, and then this uh, the energy is transferred through this 
hammer. This is called the hammer or the kill bar. And so you notice I've, I've pulled back the hammer, you know, that's what it does, you know, right? So, so I pull back this hammer and I set it, set the kill bar, and now it's set. Boy, look at that, all right? Danger, danger right now, there it is, all right? And so there's a pathway for harm and it's pathways defined by this semicircle, this circular path that the that the kill bar would take once that uh, that uh, arming bar is is let loose from the from the uh, bait pad. All right. So once it's triggered. So I want to ask you, I'm going to show you a critical step using this this rat trap. And you you tell me or uh, you decide for yourselves, does this action triggering this this uh, rat trap satisfy the definition of a critical step. All right, here we go. There we are. All right, that's what a critical step is. All right, the asset, my fingers, all right, I don't want to break a finger and I use these gloves as a little added precaution, added uh, uh, protection for my hand, just in case I got my hand in the uh, uh, pathway of harm here. Uh, and so I don't want to get get hurt. And then I use, and then the hazard is this built-in energy in the spring. And then my touch points, I was holding it and also using the tool to, to uh, operate the rat trap. So that's my demonstration of a critical step. Hopefully that conveys to you what we're talking about when we say critical step. All right. All right, can you see me again now, Julie? Yes, All your right. presentation's back now. All right, great. But I don't have control of it. <laughs> oh, well. Can you operate it from your PowerPoint presentation? No, I, can, I can't operate it can't move it forward. All right. Excuse me, folks. Just give me a couple moments here and let's see what I can do to get this thing going. Show. Um, we're not sure how you got it to work last time. <laughs> okay, so there we go. There we go. There we go. Perfect. It, there's a lot of, this is a good example where there's a lot of uncertainty in a new <laughs> new uh, program. I've never done this this particular program before, so that's probably uh, associated with my my lack of understanding. So here's a question. You, you know the definition. You've got the definition. That's it right there underneath the title. So is, is this a critical step? And the answer is no, it's not a critical step because that's a mouse, not a human being. And I say that in jest, but for the mouse, it is a critical step. So if I change the definition, you know, a mouse action that will trigger immediate, et cetera. But here in this case, yeah, this mouse has put some PPE on, it's got a hard hat, but uh, is that really gonna be sufficient protection for this uh, for this mouse. And you notice the 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 icon in the upper hand, upper right hand corner, human asset and hazard, just as a reminder of the risk that we're trying to manage. All right, here we go again. Another example. Is this a critical step? All right, I think everybody should agree that this is indeed a critical step. The asset is the toddler. Uh, and then the human is also the toddler. So the, the asset and the human are one and the same. The hazard is presumably the contents in the saucepan uh, above the stove. And so <clears throat> this is a good uh, time to talk about what, what I mean by preceding action. So obviously the action that the child is performing is a dangerous one and we can, we can see in our mind's eye that uh, that the, the contents of this saucepan would cause serious harm to the child's face and arms and perhaps other parts of his body. But, uh, but, but the question is, what were the preceding actions that set the stage for this? One is the handle of the saucepan is protruding over the edge of the stovetop that's accessible to the child. 
and that's probably the primary uh, 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 preceding action that was performed improperly. So we need to uh, move on to another example here. So here's, you, some of you folks might be familiar with this uh, 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 place. This is uh, in the English language, is Troll's Tongue. That's the rock outcrop that the hiker is standing on. And so the question is for this hiker that you see in the photograph, is the next step a critical step? There's our definition at the bottom of the slide. All right, is the next step? And it actually is not because the, 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 the hiker is about two, three steps away from the edge, either to the side, maybe four or five steps from the, from the edge uh, just, uh, directly in front of the hiker. But here's a different situation. You know, looking at the photo in the inset, that's a critical step. The next action, the next action by that 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 hiker, uh, could uh, could result in death of that hiker. And by the way, uh, just so you understand, uh, I, the the distances involved here, uh, the uh, in the U in the English in the English uh, 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 system, that's you know, more than 3,500 feet above the surface of that lake, and, but right directly below the Iker is about 700 feet. So I'm guessing, what about 200, 300, 250 meters below this Iker is uh, is the is the canyon below. So that's a critical step. So here are some examples. Uh, you can just, you know, I'll just list the question. You know, we, if we had time, we would go through each of these and uh, and discuss whether or not they are critical step. But, you know, a doctor making an incision on a patient during surgery is that a critical step? Putting on a hard hat, pulling the trigger on a firearm. Walking down a flight of stairs, and I'm going to go back and and, and describe a couple of these. <clears throat> Clicking an attachment on an email message, putting in hearing protection, uh, clicking save on an open file that you're you've been working on, uh, and lastly, walking across a, a highway or or a busy street. And so just so you, you, you understand, number one definitely is a, a critical step. Think of the, again, think of the asset uh, hazard and asset. You're, you're making an decision. You're, you're, you're creating an opportunity for, for, for contamination and, and uh, disease when you open up the, the human body. And it's, it's, by definition, incision is causing harm. <clears throat> Putting on a hard hat. Putting on a hard hat, just like number six, putting in hearing protection are not critical steps. Now they they create they put they put a barrier on your head to protect your head from falling objects or bumping into things uh, in close proximity with other uh, 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 hazards. But I can put my hard hat on, I can take my hard hat off, and nothing happens as long as I have not performed the actual action of, of bumping into something or getting into a situation where there's loud uh, 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 sources of noise that could uh, damage my ears. But the rest of those are critical steps, all right, regardless. So we're gonna go back and look at one in particular. So here's a question, do you need a parachute to skydive? And the, and, the, and the truthful answer is no, you don't need a parachute to skydive. You only need a parachute to skydive twice. Now, all humor aside here, <clears throat> the point I'm trying to make here is the, the, I want to talk about these preceding actions. The critical step for this soldier that's uh, actually leaving, leaving the helicopter is, 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 is leaping across this open threshold or this door in the helicopter. All right, but there were certain things that had to be satisfied before leaving the helicopter, before jumping out of the helicopter that, that creates safety. And in, in this case, opening the door to the helicopter creates a pathway for, for, for the soldiers inside. All right, I can close that, as long as I don't jump out, I can open that door, I can close that door. I can put the hard hat on, I can take the hard hat off, <clears throat> so to speak. 
but in this case, you know, opening a door and then uh, uh, taking steps towards the door uh, increases or decreases my margin for error. As soon as you sit in the in the threshold, such as that one soldier to the to the right of the the one jumping, he, he's he's standing on the or sitting on the edge. So he's his margin for error is much uh, uh, is is pretty high. It's pretty low where compared to the person that's inside the helicopter you know he has to make you know take two or three uh, steps to get to the edge of the of uh, the threshold so <clears throat> basically risk important actions create the conditions for work they influence how how controlled the touch point is at you know where the uh, the soldier sitting on the edge he's maintaining his his balance behind the threshold and then also the barriers and safeguards. So, so before you actually leap across that threshold, you want to make sure you have a parachute on. You want to make sure that parachute was folded correctly. You want to make sure you have the knowledge to deploy those parachutes, including the emergency chute. So when I talk about preceding actions, these are the things that we're talking about. And so here's a summary of, of the critical step you know, skydiving, leaping across the threshold of the aircraft door. And what are those preceding actions, preceding risk important actions? You got a parachute that was pr properly folded, emergency chute properly folded, parachute properly donned and secured, and the person has the knowledge of how to deploy both those chutes. So those have to precede the critical step. And you can see in the illustration below that the fact that risk important actions always precede the respective critical step, and they're reversible. Re risk important actions uh, can, you know, you can reverse those conditions. So critical step mapping, just in summary, you know, if you want to find, uh, you know, these these critical steps in your existing processes and procedures, uh, in the book, uh, critical steps, you can go to chapter seven. And uh, it, it lays out a process that fundamentally pinpoints the, the assets, the hazards, the touch points. Uh, it looks at those touch points and compares them to the definition of a critical step. Do you indeed have a critical step? And then uh, it gives you some ideas on how to control that risk. And uh, it's helpful to understand having a mental model of what it is we're trying to manage. Fundamentally, you know, here you're, I'm, I'm borrowing from uh, uh, Dr. Eric Holnagel's uh, work uh, on, on FRAM. He, this is a FRAM model, <clears throat> uh, a fun, he, which stands for Functional Resonance Analysis Method. That's a lot of academic words, but, uh, but fundamentally what we're looking at is, okay, what's that function? What's that human action that's going to create value uh, for the organization during work. And notice the inputs, assets, hazards, people, all right? And the whole function of critical steps, and you have to have critical steps. If you don't have a critical step, you do not have work. And so if you want to create value, you're going to have critical steps in your, oper in your uh, operation. So the outcome, the output should be uh, what you intended to accomplish and ultimately success for the organization and for the person uh, performing the work. <clears throat> but what are these four other nodes that, uh, that I haven't labeled here in the lower left corner are the preconditions. You have to create a pathway. If you're going to skydive, you got to open the door. All right. So there has to be a, a, a pathways created that's going to help you create value uh, uh, during the work activity. And there are risk important actions that create those cr uh, preconditions. At the same time, you have to have, there's certain resources that you have to have, things used up, tools, spare parts, et cetera. And, and you're, there are a set of risk important actions that, that set up those resources. Procedures, you may have to have procedures, you may have to have coworkers uh, uh, associated with a critical step. And then that critical step is performed in an environment where I call in the here and now. These are conditions that people work in, the local factors. <clears throat> and, uh, and some of those local factors I, ca I categorize as error traps. These are conditions that would increase the chance of a person losing control. 
All right. And again, there's risk important actions that would create error traps in the workplace. And then finally, we're talk we need to talk about, well, how are we going to protect the assets if we lose control? How are we going to fail safely? And so what defenses do we need to consider uh, uh, as far as controlling, exercising positive control of that critical step? Uh, what barriers do we need to limit the transfer of energy or limit or impede uh, 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 the movement of, of matter, solids, liquids, or gases, or maybe it's information that we need to, uh, uh, to limit. And then safeguards, if we lose control of these, of these uh, 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 built-in hazards that, uh, for the purpose of doing work, what if we lose control? Then uh, how are we gonna fail safely if we lose control at this point? So that's a model that helps us think through uh, how to manage these critical steps in the workplace. So big picture, managing critical steps is, has four elements. One, we want to identify known critical steps. You know, we can look at our procedures ahead of time using uh, what a process I call critical step mapping I referred to earlier. And, uh, and there's three opportunities uh, to identify known critical steps. That's before you do work in the planning stage, uh, in the in the work preparation stage during pre-job uh, pre briefings or, or pre-work discussions. And then there's opportunity by the worker in the workplace to detect uh, uh, potential transfers of energy or movements of matter or transmissions of information that were not identified or not anticipated in the work planning process or the procedure writing process. And those are the unknown that I'm referring to. That's the first, is identify and control those critical steps and their associated risk important actions. And then secondly, exercise positive control of critical steps. And when I say positive control, I'm referring to, uh, I define uh, positive control as what is intended to happen is what happens, and that is all that happens. So there has to be a set of controls uh, uh, that, that will uh, encourage performance of that activity, and that's all that happens. And, and you want to have positive control of that activity uh, in the workplace. Finally, or thirdly, fail safely. What what barriers and safeguards have to be in place in order to minimize the harm once you lose control? Now, if you look at the definition of critical steps, it kind of work. It, that really doesn't uh, 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 me mesh well with the definition. You know, a, hum a definition of a critical step is a human action that will trigger immediate, irreversible, intolerable harm if that action or a preceding action is performed improperly. And so, so this is the idea here: is is uh, is you're going to suffer some level of harm, but if you can minimize the harm done, minimize the severity. And then lastly, align the system, perhaps realign the system to support these first three. What does your system have to look like organizationally, structurally, in order to support identifying and controlling critical steps, exercising positive control, and failing safely? So what can you do tomorrow? Uh, one is identify your high risk work those human activities that cannot fail. And the focus here is not so much on hazard identification as it is on what are the assets that you need to protect from harm. Secondly, what are those critical steps? What are the related risk important actions for those activities? And again, in the book, you can look at critical step mapping that'll help you pinpoint those uh, in advance of the work in the, wor in, the, in the workplace. Secondly, you can create hold points there's a let's let's uh, create uh, an opportunity for the frontline workers to stop and think. Okay, are the are the conditions proper for performing this critical step? In other words, you're sitting in the in the doorway of that helicopter, and you stop for a moment. You think, okay, do I have a parachute on? Has it been? Do I have confidence that it's been uh, uh, folded correctly? Do I know how to deploy both the main chute? and the emergency shoot. Do you have, do you, are those conditions established? Give them time to think. And then 
how would I exercise pause and control? Once I'm in the, once I'm out of the aircraft, you know, how do I, how do I exercise pause and control of exercising, opening the main chute, you know, pulling that D ring to make sure the, 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 uh, the main chute deploys. And then finally, how do I fail safely? All right, if that main chute doesn't work, deploy the emergency chute. That's the that's a, uh, a safeguard associated with uh, skydiving. So these things you can do tomorrow. It doesn't, all you need to understand is the definitions of critical steps and what risk important actions do. And you know that's from this presentation. You can do these things tomorrow or within the next week with little or no uh, resource allocation. So finally, uh, I wanna make a, a, an important point here. Is 99% good enough? All right. And I would say it's not good enough. Um, you see the quote by, there by Winston Churchill. <clears throat> but what we need at critical steps is perfection. Now, some people are gonna push against that. I believe that it's important that Critical steps have to go right first time every time or else you suffer serious consequences. All right. But good enough is good enough when there is nothing at stake. All right. And that's a, you, that depends on management's understanding of what the level of severity, and they specify that level of severity uh, that would be associated with critical steps. You know, and so 99.9% is good enough for all activities that don't involve critical steps. So in a sense, uh, pinpointing your critical steps improves efficiency. You can, you can leave the rest of the work <clears throat> to the, uh, to the uh, uh, level of reliability of most normal human activities. All right, but when you come to a critical step, you wanna stop, make sure you got the correct conditions. You've created the conditions for safety when you perform that work. So I want to leave that with you, and I think we got some time. I got some time here for some uh, you know, questions. So let's open it up to the to the to the audience here. I know that was quick and dirty. I apologize for going through this as quickly as I did, uh, but that's that's the basis basics of the book. Great, thank you for that presentation. You're perfectly on time. We've got 15 minutes to go, so your timing is impeccable. I don't have any questions through yet, so if anybody's got any questions for Tony, if you want to put them through now. Meanwhile, if we go across to Mohit, Mohit, do you have any questions for Tony in the meantime? Uh, yes, uh, the example were like fantastic. Uh, just one question, so, which I like human and operational performance. Generally, in the, in the industries, mainly in the construction industries, the human behavior like uh, which we see, it is not consistent. If Depending on the priority, I would say, depending on the job priority, uh, the human performance, uh, or I would say the attitude, it changes. If they see like uh, this, we need to do it, uh, task complete, like if any milestone or something, then definitely, which I have seen somehow the safety priority or quality priority, they like step back and they focus on. So in that certain situation, how to do it, how we can, uh, what all efforts we can, we can initiate or what, what would be the best if the person priorities to still to make the safety or quality or whatever thing. Yeah, this, if I understand uh, your question correct, Mohit, uh, managers need to define <clears throat> what are those assets that are most important to the operation. Obviously, people's personal safety and you know occupational safety and, and health and well-being is, 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 uh, is on that list. But what about the products? Uh, what are about the key materials and equipment that the people are working with? What about the, uh, the the environment that people are working in? And so managers look at those things, and then what would define a an event or or a mishap that would satisfy the level of severity uh, uh, associated with uh, those assets? And so so that's a management decision. That's a management decision. But from the and then once the frontline workers know 
What are they trying to accomplish? This is why it's important for the frontline workers to know what's the business, uh, what's the value add that they're trying to create. Because if they know what the work it is that they're trying to create, they'll know where uh, a hazards come into contact with those assets. So I'm a big, you know, I served on a submarine, a nuclear powered submarine. We were at sea and uh, there were certain activities that we knew absolutely had to go right first time, every time in order for the submarine to survive. And uh, obviously for the people in the submarine to survive. And so we knew those up front and we had to, we had to continually train and educate those, those operators, the, the people on the submarine, to know how that submarine operates and how to, how to, how to uh, make sure it, it survives. So technical expertise, technical training is, is a prerequisite for the frontline operators, the, the frontline workers. They have to understand the technology that they're working with so that they would recognize transfers of energy, so that they would recognize transfers of, of, of uh, or movements of, of fluids or movements of matter uh, from one place to another place. And so those are the kind of things that, that would help uh, managers up front uh, to help uh, identify what must go right first time every time. I'm not sure I answered your question there, Mohit. Yeah, no, yeah, uh, somewhere, somewhere it was uh, to the relevancy. It is okay, I agreed depending on the management priorities and continuous of it. You can Thank look you. at your history. You can look at your event history that's caused a lot of uh, 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 problems for the organization. And that's usually a good starting point is uh, what, what events have we had that have, uh, that, you know, what are the assets that have suffered harm that we want to avoid going, into, uh, going forward? Right, right. Agree. Agree. Okay, we've had one more question, and um, and that is why why do you think the main reason that so many people take the critical step resulting in an incident slash injury? Why do they do what now? Sorry, I think it's what do you think the main reason that so many take the critical step resulting in an accident, incident, oh, well. or injury? You, you have to perform, critical steps are necessary. You have to do work, you know, in order to do work, there's, there will be critical steps, all right? That's part of the job. The ch what, I'm, what I'm trying to pr uh, promote here is recognition, identifying those work activities that absolutely have to go right first time, every time. And so typically your top performers, your, your, your people in your organization that are uh, uh, the, uh, uh, most reliable in their activities generally recognize those those transfers of energy, those movements of matter and information that if they lose control could cause harm. And so, so it's it, I call that chronic unease. So there's a level of chronic unease that your top performers tend to have uh, because they have the technical expertise. They know how the technology works, and so they take extra precautions to exercise positive control of those particular activities and, uh, and, and and they 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 generally uh, suffer fewer mistakes fewer fewer occasions where they lose control great thank you um mm -hmm. that's all the questions for now um, mohit would you like to say the closing comments uh, yes uh, thanks julie and uh, definitely, like uh, it was one of the great insightful uh, session on hops, and uh, it was something different, which uh, in our branch event uh, we haven't uh, gone through it. Uh, as well, the brilliant presentations and the way of uh, delivering the session with examples and all the other live demonstrations, which re really impacted to me. And I hope all of our uh, attendees. All of our members from WSM across the globe, they would have really loved it. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you, sir, for your uh, valuable time and sharing your knowledge with WSM India branch. And we hope in future also to collaborate with you for further more sessions. Thank you for inviting me. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you, thank Julie. You.
Thank you, Tony, and thank you, Mohit. Mohit, did you just want to mention ne next week's webinar before we sign off? Uh, uh, yes. Uh, I put like, you on the spot there, haven't I? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, we already posted our uh, the next week webinars detail on our WISM LinkedIn page. Uh, to all the members of WISM, I would suggest to please uh, go through the LinkedIn page, uh, have a register, and also the emails have been forwarded from WISM official email to all of your personal email IDs. You may please register and see you again on the next coming week before this year ends. That's it, Julie. Great. Um, have a great evening or afternoon, everyone, wherever you are in the world, and we hope to see you at our next webinar. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.